There are seasons of history. There's seasons of nature, there's seasons of your life, and there's seasons of history. And if you live long enough, 80 years or more, you're probably gonna live all four seasons. Good times create weak people. Weak people create bad times. Bad times create strong people. Strong people create great times. That's where we're heading. Every person I meet is superior to me. I know that every person in this room has life experience I don't have, so you're gonna be superior to me to something. I also know I'm superior to every person I meet in some context, because I spent 46 years of my life obsessed, constantly improving, all over the earth, working with the greatest, smartest people on earth, and I have to be an idiot not to learn from them. Therefore, we're equal. Therefore, I treat people that way. And I think if you can have that kind of respect, that means we could agree to disagree. We can have a different point of view. This is part two of my conversation with none other than Tony Robbins. And during this segment, we're gonna be going into a Q&A he had with my Abundance 360 audience, really coaching them on how to do big and bold missions on the planet, how to take moonshots, and how to think from a purpose-driven point of view. Take a listen, a lot of great coaching here. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's jump in. In the last three years, I mean, the uh, level of uh, generational trauma that this really messed up and I believe very much orchestrated pandemic has created. Um, so many people, thank you. So many people that I used to admire, leaders and stuff, I've lost a lot of faith in and then I've seen a lot of real warriors. So you take someone like Elon Musk who uh, po tweets, arrest Fauci, which I think they should. Um, who do you admire? Who do you look up to that you could talk about versus, you know, it, it, at the level of influence you have, it needs, because there's, I believe whoever profits from the crime is guilty of it. So you said good people in the media, and I think that's a nice way of, you know, acknowledging a lot of people. And there are, you know, Stalin called, I believe, the media the useful idiots. And there's a lot of them that know exactly what they're doing. Pharmaceutical companies that are profiting off the death of people. And, you know, how, where's your limit of what you will say, you know, I'm not going to go there versus these people are fucked up, they're evil, this shit needs to stop. Well, that's a very interesting question to start with. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, you know, feeding the world. <laughs> no, and that's, that's good. Uh, and there's I, I also you. for I you. I think, um, I think you all have to, I, I don't take a political stand. And I worked yeah. with Clinton. I remember I had it. This is the way the world used to be. I worked with President Clinton. It's by the way, he didn't have an email account. I introduced him to AOL when we started doing email. <laughs> this crazy president of the United States didn't have it. That shows you how much the world has changed. Uh, you have more power in your pocket than he had as president back then. And then I went across the aisle on the same day and had a conversation with Gingrich. And I was helping both of them because I'm an independent. I voted, I voted on both sides of the aisle. I'm not, I don't believe in dogma. I believe in the right people. And I also believe that everybody wants the same thing, right? We all want the same thing. Mm -hmm. The only thing we disagree about is the how. Right? Everybody wants safety for their children. Some people think you should have guns to do it. Some people should have no guns to do it, right? But, but we all want safety for our kids and for each other. And we lose track of what's there when we start to demonize. And uh, I had the privilege of, of interviewing Mr. Gorbachev years and years ago. And I'm gonna answer your question in a roundabout way, but I think the story will help just for a second if I may, and then I'll answer your question very directly as well. Um, I got a call from Bush Sr. This is not George W., but his dad. And he's president of the United States, and I'd met him a couple times, and I get this phone call, and I was, I don't know, 30, 31 years old. And he says, Tony, he said, uh, we're having this meeting, and the wall had just come down. And he said, uh, we're going to get together with Mr. Meteoron from France, Maggie Thatcher from the UK, myself, Mr. Gorbachev, and a hundred other people to say, where does the world go now that the, the walls come down? You know, what's, now the communism is, you know, on the run, what, what can we make happen? And he said, we've picked people from different walks of life we think are brilliant, and you've been selected as one of those people. And I was like, completely blown away. And then I said, well, I said, I'm, I'm, you know, will I do it? Of course I'll do it. I'm happy to come. It's a privilege. And then he said, I was looking at your calendar. Are you doing an event in New York, right? But he told me the dates. And I said, yes. And he goes, well, do you have a plane? And I said, yeah, I had a charter plane in those days. I didn't own it. And he said, well, Mr. Gorbachev's in New York as well. How would you like to fly him to the event since you both come, come from New York? I said, let me pause for 0.2 seconds, see whether I want to do that or not. I'm a history buff. I, I want to know what changes history. So I said, 
absolutely. I said, um, I, I said, uh, how many people does he have? So I discovered I had to charter a Gulfstream in those days, which was a big investment, but I was like, oh, it'll be worth it. And I said, one, one request, can you ask Mr. Gorbachev, could I ask him three questions on camera for these kids who I sponsor their college education to have a, you know, a world leader talk to them, it'd be pretty amazing. No problem. So I get to the day and four limousines pull off and Gorby comes out with his big scar and he walks up and he does not look happy. And I got the camera guy right there for the three quick questions. He shakes my hand and just, I said, we're going to do the interview. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, what's, and he just got on the plane. And so I turned to his guys and he goes, he's really sorry, but he has a massive migraine headache and he's not going to do the video. And I'm like, holy shit. In those days, 50 grand for a charter was a lot of money for me. I was like, holy crap, I'm, I'm going on this plane. Then I get on the plane. It's like, I want to know when into the Cold War. And he closes his eyes. I'm like, holy shit, this whole thing is not working well. So I started talking to his wife because I figured if I talk to her enough, she'll say something. Every man wants to contradict his wife at some point. It'll show up. <laughs> so I started asking about the, the change from Soviet Union to Russia and how they were treating Mr. Gorbachev. And sure enough, she said something and his eyes popped open. Bada, 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 you know, and the interpreter starts telling me what he's saying. And I said, well, Mr. Gorbachev, so great to be able to talk to you. I said, uh, I know you're not feeling well. I just have one question before you close your eyes. I want to know what ended the Cold War. It's the most important change in the last century where two countries could touch a button and destroy the whole planet. And you were one of the people that ended it. I don't know what. And he looked at me and then started talking in this sing-songy town. When someone has said, told you something or told many people the same thing, sometimes they get a little sing-song. You know, they've told it before. And what he said was, it was the end of demonization. So I feel just as strongly about some things you do, but demonization is not the answer, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. And so, and you just demonized everybody. I'm not making you wrong. I'm just saying we all do it. I've done it. So we all do it. But he said, it was the end of demonization. I said, what does that mean? He goes, well, you know, Mr. Gorbachev or Mr. Reagan was saying that we're the evil empire. And, you know, you know, I was telling him, you know, no, capitalism is evil. And I said, well, I really appreciate the answer, sir. But I said, I want to know the moment. History changes in a moment. There's a moment of decision that changes anybody's life. I want to know what the moment was that the, the Cold War ended. And he paused for a long time. He said, no one's ever asked me that. The interpreter tells me since he says it. I said, well, I want the answer. I said, only three more hours on the plane if you don't give it to me, right? <laughs> and I got him laughing a little bit. And he closed his eyes for a little bit. He thought for a little, he was really thoughtful. And then he said, I'll never forget. He started, first he started hitting his leg like this. And then I realized he's laughing, like out of control, like he had too much vodka or something, right? He was like, he goes, I will tell you, he spoke in English, I will tell you, he says in English. And then he started talking in Russian really fast, and the guy interpreted, he said, Reagan and I were together and we're having this argument. And he was lecturing me on the evils of communism. And I said to him, you are not my teacher, and I am not your student, and you will not speak to me this way. And he, I told him how evil capitalism was. And he said, in the middle of this argument, he said, I got so mad, he said, I felt my face burning, I was so angry. And he said, all of a sudden, Mr. Reagan stood up and said, this is not working. He took two steps away and went back and went, let's start fresh, shall we? <laughs> My name's Ron, are you Mikhail, right? And he said, you had to love the guy. He goes, this is a man I could do business with. And he said, and then he said that Reagan did something that Reagan would never normally do, because he demonized. He brought a group of, I think it was 50 American children over and let Gorbachev take them around the Soviet Union, which then became Russia. And he said, that touched my heart. Now I asked Reagan years later, the moment the Cold War ended. He gave me a similar situation, but not the same moment. They were in Reykjavik and they were negotiating over the first destruction of long range nuclear weapons. And he said he was talking to Gorbachev and it was getting more and more heated. And as he described, he said, Gorbachev, you knew it was mad because his whole face, get, the top of his head gets red, including that scar. And he said he was getting more and more angry and Reagan all of a sudden said, why don't we go on a walk? And I guess Gorbachev's response was, is he crazy? Was something like that through his interpreter. And he goes, no, let's just go on a walk. He goes, it's freezing out. Let's go on a walk. Think of the genius of this. They're sitting Change across like this fighting. Yeah. Now all of a sudden they get up, put on their coats. That's changing their whole state. All your decisions are controlled by your state, your mental, emotional state. You want to perform at a different level, you need a different state. You're in a lousy state, you're gonna snap at people over nothing, right? 
So they change state, and now they're walking outside in the freezing cold. That'll change your state. Mm -hmm. Side by side, and on that walk, they made the first agreements to destroy long-range nuclear weapons in the history of the world. So moments can change, but it doesn't come, in my experience, from demonization, even if you feel something's unjust, because I think a lot of things you're saying have validity to them, potentially, in terms of the cover-ups and the misinformation and miscommunication, and we've certainly seen that with Twitter, thanks to Elon, so I'm grateful. Answer your question, who do I respect? I respect a lot of people. I respect people on both sides of the aisle. I vote on both sides of the aisle. But I'd say right now, I think uh, DeSantis, because I live in Florida, I've seen, we only had two weeks of shutdown in the whole state, we don't wear masks. We, our numbers, we're supposed to have the most deaths. We have the most old people. We don't. We're better than New York or California in our ratios. Um, you know, he made the monoclonal antibodies available to people, so there were early solutions that were available. He's taken on tough decisions. He's not, he's not going to, no one's going to be the same with all your political views, but I think he's a leader. To me, a politician is someone who looks to see what everybody says and then says what they want to say. A leader does what's right. And if they're really effective, people, they'll become popular. Maybe they won't, but they'll be willing to make those decisions. So he'd be one person that I can tell you right now, but I, there are many people in the private sector, many people that I respect from every walk of of life. I, my view is this. Every person I meet is superior to me. And I don't, I'm not phony and I'm not inferior. I know that every person in this room has life experience I don't have. So you're going to be superior to me to something. I don't know if it's sing better than I do or dance. I can't do either one of those things. Or it's something you do with math I, or it's something in your, I don't know, but I'm sure there's something. Well, you might be better at being depressed than I am too. So that's possible too. I don't want that. <laughs> people. people are better at something. So I, because everyone is superior to me because they have different life experience, I respect everybody. I also know I'm superior to every person I meet in some context because I spent 46 years of my life obsessed, constantly improving all over the earth, working with the greatest, smartest people on earth. And I have to be an idiot not to learn from them. So it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I've had a unique life experience. And so I, in my area, I'm superior. Therefore, we're equal. Therefore, I treat people that way. And I think if you can have that kind of respect, that means we could agree to disagree. We can have a different point of view. I have lots of friends that have very different, let's say, political views than I may have, but we still get along. It's not like where we are today, where you can't talk to somebody or you feel unsafe if someone has a different point of view. That is the most insane and stupid thing I've ever heard in my life. And our kids are being taught that bullshit, right? So I'm not here to make a political statement, but the only way we get better as we respect each other, we find some middle ground. That's All right, Joe, thing. thank you so much. Let's go to Carla on mic number three. How can we help these young adults? In the fall of 2020, I was called into action to work with highly anxious students who entered college under the COVID restrictions. So I've had, for a couple of years, I did that work and I had my fingers on their anxiety and depression. And when I, and I tell them all about Tony Robbins, you've done so much for me, they don't believe it'll help. Their depression makes them think that even if they're very self-aware, nothing will help. And I've made baby steps. I've gotten kids out of the crisis. I kept kids in college that really were going on to do great things that required a college education. But I'm worried about them. And I have three in college personally. Wow. Well, you're describing the pattern of learned helplessness, aren't you? Yeah. Yep. Right? Learned helplessness is very simple. It's when your brain starts to believe that a problem is permanent and you believe it's pervasive because you have this problem in your relationship, your whole life's over. If you have this problem in your business, your whole life's over. It's not true, but when you believe a problem is permanent and pervasive, a belief is a feeling of absolute certainty. We talked about it earlier. You can be certain about your problem, right? And then if you add to that, it's personal. Those three Ps, it's, 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 it's a permanent situation, it's gonna affect your whole life, and it's personal. When you start believing those three things, you don't change, and that's what these kids have been hypnotized into believing, and the reason is because we as a generation have raised them differently. Every generation, when I mentioned to you, uh, you know, going to see President Clinton on the same day seeing Gingrich, on that day, by the way, I saw a book that I highly recommend you all get. Uh, it was a book that both of these leaders had on their desk. It was called Generations, by Strauss and Howe. It's a large book. It explains how, in 560 years at that point of Anglo-American history, how we raise our children in reaction to how we're raised. Maybe you and I individually aren't the same, but as a culture we do. And why that makes history have these repeating seasons, so to speak. And so I think, I think it's really important to understand that, you know, kids today have been so weakened by parents that have been overprotective. So, so here, here's, 
here's a, a way of thinking about it that hopefully will give us all pause to be able to have a little more excitement about the future, especially if you're worried about kids. If you look at human beings, all of our progress comes because we learn three skills. Elon's unbelievable at this. You're incredible at this. Anybody in this room is good at anything. You're good at three skills. Skill one is you're good at pattern recognition in something. When you can recognize patterns, you're no longer in chaos. You're no longer in fear. You start to see there's a reason this is occurring. It isn't random. And therefore, I can anticipate. Think about it. Why do children always beat an adult in playing some video games? You get a video game, they always win. Why do they win? Because they're younger? Because they're smarter? Because they're faster? No, because they played this game before. They know the first bad guy's here, the next bad guy's here. So they tell you, go first, you're dead in three seconds. They go, and an hour later, you get your second turn. Who knows what I'm talking about here, right? <laughs> so it's not that they're smarter, it's they know the pattern. And when you know the pattern, you can anticipate. Anticipation is the ultimate advantage in business and in life. Leaders anticipate, losers react. So when you can recognize patterns, I'm good at that with human behavior and emotion and psychology. I'm also good at it in business at this point, so I've got the companies I do. You can get good at it investing, anything. But when you're really good at recognizing patterns, then the second skill is utilizing those patterns. And we have patterns within ourselves. You're not angry all the time. You're not sad all the time. These kids aren't angry all the time or sad all the time. They get triggered, they call it. Triggered is the biggest bullshit word. It was designed for people having phobic responses. Now we use it when people are uncomfortable. We literally infected our culture with language that makes people debilitated. It's absurd. So the point of the matter, though, is there's a pattern. You can re recognize what the pattern is. Now, when you really get good, when you're Elon, when you're the people in this room, you probably become a pattern creator. Now you're masterful in what you do. Now you can make anything happen. So, and that's what a moonshot's about, right? It's like recognizing a pattern, finding a way to utilize what's there to solve it, and then creating some new patterns that can make it all work. And so if you look at that and you say, okay, so what do I want my kids to have in the future? I want them to have these three skills, because I don't know the real number. You read the same studies I do. 40, 50% of jobs are going to be gone in five to 15 years, depending upon whose crap you read. It'll be replaced by robots. It'll be replaced by algorithms. It'll be replaced by AIs. So what's going to give them security in their future? The ability to recognize patterns is the ability to learn. The ability to utilize them makes you effective. The ability to create them makes you masterful. You play music, you usually play somebody else's music first. You recognize the pattern. You learn to use it. Then after enough time, You've played enough, you can create your own music. That's where we start to become creators and not just people managing our lives. So what made humanity transform from you know, hunter-gatherers that were worried about survival all the time to communities? Only one recognition of a pattern, the pattern of seasons. Think of how profound that was for humanity. Before that, you could plant, but it didn't work most of the time. People couldn't figure out why, because if you do the right thing at the wrong time, you're screwed. It's not enough to do the right thing. You gotta understand the timing. So once we understood, oh, if you plant in the winter, you're screwed. There's only one time, plant in the spring, take care of it through the summer, reap in the fall, save some of it so you do well in winter. It allowed us to build communities and nation states. We're here because of that. So then think about this. There's a pattern in your own seasons of your life. Imagine zero to 21, 19, 20, 21 is your springtime. Everything grows in spring. You could be an idiot and grow in spring. If you're in business in spring and you make money, you think you're a genius, bullshit. You're just in a great economy. A rising tide lifts all boats. If you're halfway smart, you do well. But in your life, in zero to 21, you're pretty much looked out for. Now, some of us had to work at seven or eight years old, but most people have a time in which people are taking care of you to a certain extent, and you're being told what to believe. Those first 20 years, 19, 20, 21, then you come of age and you decide to test it. Now you're in your own summertime. Now you are the soldier of society, aren't you? 21, 22 to 42, roughly. You're the person that be literally is the soldier or the general. You're the person there that's starting the businesses or working for the people starting those businesses. You're growing, you're learning, and you're gonna test everything. When you're under 20, you think you're invincible. You're gonna be president of the United States, you're gonna have $10 billion in, 10 relationships and you can't even own a one and you don't have enough money to pay for shit, right? You discover you're not invincible. You find out relationships are more complex, right? So 22 to 42 is this testing. What do I believe? What's really true? And if you work hard during that time, you develop tremendous skill and insights, which allows you to move into the reaping time of fall, which is usually 43, different for everybody, right? But 43 to 63, roughly. 
that 20 year period should be the greatest time of your life if you worked hard in the spring and you, you took care of things in the summer. Otherwise, you're gonna be weeping in the fall, not reaping in the fall, right? So in that time, is, that's where you are in power. And most of you in this room, who in this room is in that stage of life? I'm curious, 43 to 63, look around the room. It's this whole freaking room, practically. Who's in the 22 to 42 range in this room? Okay, anybody under 22 in this room, right? Fantastic. So it's, and by the way, some people are early, right? Not everybody's the same. I'm giving you generalizations for seasons, just like seasons. You don't go from winter straight to, or I should say from fall straight to spring. Right? You got you to go through the seasons in the order. Some winters are hard, some are easy. Same thing true of these stages of life. So 43 to 63, I look at that as like, that's the harvest time. That's where you really come into yourself. Then you're no longer trying to prove yourself to anybody where you know who the hell you are if you've done your work. 64 to 84 to 120, that's, your, that's the winter. That's elderhood. That's where you get to be the leader. That's where you get to be the mentor of life. Uh, excuse me, we've been talking about you know, 64 to 84 is sort of... I just said 120. You, oh, I, I missed that. But, you uh, did miss that. We, got, we have to rewrite It was for you slide. you didn't even hear it. What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> when, you Peter and I, when Peter and I went and we spoke at the Vatican together and Peter had this session, it was a brilliant session he did on age and he asked this group of people, they're all regenerative doctors, how many of you all live to be 120 or more? And like, I don't know, like... A quarter, a third? A Not max. even a third. A quarter max, raise your hand. And he was crestfallen. Right? I said, Peter, it's because you're asking about age, not about quality of life. Like if you could be 120, have you know the vitality of 35 or 40, it's a different thing. But the point is, if you have a long enough lifespan, which we all should have now, and David's a good friend of ours, and you know you got to hear him today, if he's some of the cutting edge in that area, and so many other people. That's a different time, right? You now know who you are, and it can be the most happy time of your entire life if you took care of your health and you're there. So let me give you one last one, and you understand why I'm bringing this up. There are seasons of history. There are seasons of nature, there are seasons of your life, and there are seasons of history. And if you live long enough, 80 years or more, you're probably gonna live all four seasons. They used to laugh 100 years. If you study 1,000 years of Roman history, you'll see this happen like clockwork. It used to be 25-year cycles, now it's 20-year cycles. And what happens? The same cycles over and over again. So I'll give you an example. Let's take a simple example. Let's say you were born in 1910, and you'll see why I'm bringing this up about the kids. In 1910, if you were born then, and you start to come of age, think about this, 1910 to 1920, 21, 22, 23, guess what? We win World War I, there's this great celebration, all this new technology, radio and television, oh my God, airplanes, airplanes. and yeah. cars. And that generation that was growing up in that environment, they were known as flappers. They were like millennials and Zs. They weren't respected by older generations. They seemed irresponsible, they seemed unbelievably weak, and they were. They were incredibly weak. And everybody made fun of them. And they didn't give a damn. But what was interesting was, when that 1910 person turns 19, it's what year? Calculators are available. <laughs> 1929. So right when you're gonna get your car and go party and all those things, what did they hit their face on? The biggest depression in history. And guess what? People are jumping out of buildings. If you're in the Midwest, you got the bus bowl, people are standing in line for bread. That's what they entered at the stage of life they thought they were gonna celebrate. They were growing up in a protected environment and they entered a winter. And by the way, it wasn't over because after 10 years, they make it to 29 years old, it's 1939. Well, guess what their reward is for making it through 10 years of depression? World War II. Now, none of us in this room are old enough to remember it, but those who are alive will tell you, we weren't gonna win that war. It didn't look like we we're winning. The stock market crashed. Hitler was blitzkrieging taking down countries in days and weeks. London was being bombed. It looked like the end of the world, not the shit we have now that we make up the end of the world, so we can somehow, I know, virtue signal that we're on top of things. It was really a scary time. But this generation of flappers, these weak ass kids, responded because they had to. Necessity is the mother of invention, and they got unbelievably strong, and they won the war, and they came back to heroes, and they're still known in American culture as the greatest or the great generation, aren't they? Why? Because they went through the prime of life in winter. Now, some people go through winter as a child, and they're protected. Some people do it through that 22 to 42, some 42, some the older stage of life. But we're in winter right now. 
By the way, here's the good news, by the way. What happened after the war? What finishes winter? What always follows? Spring. Spring. What follows the horrible day, the horrible night, the beautiful day. So what happens? There's this springtime. We veterans get jobs. We open up the community. Everything changes. There is an optimism from 1945, roughly 46, till about 1963, about 18 years, until John F. Kennedy gets killed. Then we go through a really intense summer of internal conflict. Martin Luther King is killed. Robert Kennedy is killed. Older, young people are telling older people, screw you, I don't think you're a hero. You're not fair to women or black or white. And we have an internal revolution. You can see this again and again in history. There's a great book by the same guys who wrote Generations called The Fourth Turning. I'd highly recommend it to all of you if you want to understand what's really happening right now. If you want to recognize the pattern. It'll show you, you'll be reading a passage and then you'll realize it was written in the 1800s, in the 1600s. These cycles are consistent. So we're in winter right now. By the way, what happened? You had the springtime, then you had the summer. Think about the 60s and 70s. Were they different than the late 40s and 50s? Completely. Different mindset. If you ask students in college at that time, they did this, they've done this question for 60 years now. So in the 60s and 70s, they said, what do you need most in your mind to have a great quality of life? Pragmatic knowledge to make a great income or a philosophy of life that makes you happy? 60s and 70s, which one do you think 82% said? Philosophy of life, 60s and 70s. It wasn't the money. <laughs> Somebody, you clearly weren't there or you're still drugged from that time. You don't know what's going on. <laughs> but it, what happened? Were the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, anything like the 60s and 70s? Completely different mood. Total shift. And by the way, the X generation, of those of your X generation, the baby boomers were out doing their mission, having time, making love, protesting the war. They had their view of life. They didn't take much good care of their kids. They weren't paying attention. Their kids became pragmatic. They learned to raise themselves. They learned to turn on the TV. They created the next generation. They were raised differently. The next generation that were under taken care of became the people that turned around and changed how we raise babies today and adults today. They're the ones that created Baby on Board. Think about it. The movies about children in the 60s and 70s were Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> And in the 80s, it was three men and a baby, baby on board, and babies are everything, helicopter parents calling the teacher and saying, my student deserves a better score than that, a better grade than that. I couldn't even imagine that shit in my generation. But they, that's what they've done. So that generation, to answer your question, ma'am, while I know you're fearful, I'm not fearful. They are going to, we're halfway through winter if you study history, no one knows exactly. We probably got another eight years of this. That does not mean every day is a bad day. It just means there'll be more negativity reported than positivity. The mood has shifted. People will exaggerate the problem instead of the solution. So you have to be your own person instead of letting society lead you, and then you're not going to have those challenges. But during this time period, this is a beautiful time because winter makes people stronger. Here's the history of the world in four sentences. Give it to you really easy. Good times create weak people. You've got a whole generation of people that have had everything at their fingertips. They haven't paid for it. They haven't to do anything for it. There are 7 million American men from 18 to 38 years old that live at home still and are not looking for a job. They get Uber Eats and they play video games. 7 million. That's only possible in a culture that has had such abundance and no real war that they've had to be a part of. So good times create weak people. Weak people create bad times. Bad times create strong people. Strong people create great times. That's where we're heading. That's where these children are going to have to answer your question, right? Hey, everybody. This is Peter. A quick break from the episode. You know, I'm a firm believer that science and technology and how entrepreneurs can change the world is the only real news out there worth consuming. I don't watch the crisis news network I call CNN or Fox and hear every devastating piece of news on the planet. I spend my time training my neural net the way I see the world by looking at the incredible breakthroughs in science and technology, how entrepreneurs are solving the world's grand challenges, what the breakthroughs are in longevity, how exponential technologies are transforming our world. So twice a week, I put out a blog. One blog is looking at the future of longevity, age reversal, biotech, increasing your health span. The other blog looks at exponential technologies, AI, 
3D printing, synthetic biology, AR, VR, blockchain, these technologies are transforming what you as an entrepreneur can do. If this is the kind of news you want to learn about and shape your neural nets with, go to demandis.com backslash blog and learn more. Now back to the episode. Right. Amazing. I want to go to just a couple of questions. You got it. Uh, the launch time is now 7.38. You can tell what I care about here. Uh, <laughs> Shut me up. <laughs> Uh, I want to go to Zoom to Balin, if we would. Zoom. Balin, where are you on the planet, and what is your question for Tony? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, but I can't see awesome. you. Awesome. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah, name is Balin. I'm from uh, Montreal, Canada. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Tony, you're a huge inspiration to me, and uh, this one is sort of directed to you. Um, so you talk a lot about changing uh, your identity and change your life, which I am all on board for. But like, how do you navigate rewriting yourself when, and, or changing your identity or establishing a new moonshot when so much of what you've done in life may say, might say otherwise? As I'm, I'm sure a lot of other people at this conference especially have been inspired by a lot of the ideas we've heard here and want to go apply those later on um, in, in life. And uh, so how do you, what, are, what sort of strategies or tools might you recommend for, for us to kind of carry those ideas on and uh, do something that might be outside of our, our wheelhouse? So to speak? If you only had like a five-day program where people could go to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think, I, I, I want to clarify your question if I may. You say it's not, give me an example that's specific if you don't mind so I can, I can address it specifically instead of generally. You're saying you want to do a moonshot that's inconsistent with your past? Is that what I heard? I'm not trying to understand. Yeah, well, I mean, like so much of what I've done has really been, I mean, I'm an aerospace engineer by trade and um, so much of what I've done in life uh, has been based my career on furthering space propulsion. I'm really passionate about that. But I've been thinking a lot about, uh, you know, maybe the impact I could have um, with other technologies like AI quantum technology especially and i'm wondering if you know like like if i should do that and you know are those are like and i'm because i'm equally passionate about technology in general and what like what is, i've been thinking a lot about what are what is the greatest impact i could possibly have balen do you remember and, do you remember what imad said was the single most important attribute for the ai uh partners and programmers he was bringing on Satellite imagery, I think he was talking about. What was the number one thing that he was looking for? Passion. This is a brand new field that is just started. And if your passion is to go and do that, you can pick it up and learn it and catch up very quickly. Uh, but uh, can I give you, may I give you some coaching? Is that is okay? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> you're, 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 not, you're in a state of uncertainty, so I wouldn't do anything out of this state. You'll, there's no way you'll follow through. You, you need to go gather more experience. You need to go where, get around where it's better and have something hit you that is specific and go for it. Because right now you're asking a generalized question and you're asking it from a place of uncertainty. It's like, this is what I know, I don't really know this. So this is exactly what I talked about earlier. In a state of uncertainty, you don't know the how, you don't even know the what yet. So the answer to your question is, no one can answer that question until you get around something that you are truly passionate about. And what I would do is, I would start to put myself in these environments with people of this nature and find something that grabbed me. Then when the thing grabs you, now you turn that something very measurable and specific. And I noticed you guys use 10 years as your goals. Most of mine are 10 year goals too. And then I try to beat them, but I measure it each year. Uh, Martin Rothblatt, who's a mutual friend of ours, both of ours, who's a genius, who's had so many breakthroughs in medicine and satellites and everything else, built serious yeah. FM and so forth. Her whole thing is, okay, I chunk it down into one year modules of that. But you're missing right now, you don't know the what and why yet. You just know there's an industry that's possible and it's different than what you're doing. So I admire you that your willingness, because most people won't step into the uncertain. So I want to know, I respect you for that. You're like, I'm not really sure. And so you're wanting certainty. You can't have certainty till you find what it is. So go get your ass in the environment with enough people and let something hit you. And then you won't need anybody's coaching. I mean, you can certainly get refinement of your coaching, but you'll go, this is it. And then you can say, who else would join you on that journey? Who else shares your vision in that area? And then set your specifics and then go crush it. But I think right now you're trying to make the decision before you have enough experience of what's gonna make you excited. I think you're passionate about technology as a whole, but that kind of generalization won't get you there. It's the specificity that'll get you there. So be kind to yourself and get yourself, you know, while you're doing what you're doing, go put yourself in these environments. You know, you're, you've got a network here of people and you'll figure something will grab you and then you'll do it. And the only other question I'd say too is it's wonderful to ask the question, 
What can I do will have the most impact? But I think you also have to ask yourself, what do I want to do? You know, because a lot of times there are things you do with impact and you'll run out of gas because it's just not fulfilling enough. You gotta find out what's fulfilling. The projects I've picked are fulfilling. When I see a child whose life has been saved, you know, because we've got fresh water, or I see somebody who's got food and never had it before, or a child that's got saved who was in slavery and we got them out. Those are measurable pieces that have like keep me going. And, you know, I don't have to wait till I get the goal someday. I'm getting feedback all the time. And also I'm getting the feedback in my own mind, which is I, I'm not going to meet 99% of the people I've ever helped. They'll never thank me. They don't need to. I know. And that gives me drive at a different level. I'm not doing it for accolades. I'm doing it because it's right. And that'll give you more power than any accolades that some people look for or any economics. And then if you do this right, you'll, you'll make great economics as well. But my, my number one piece is get to a place where you want something so bad you can find that certainty. You're not there yet. That doesn't mean you couldn't get there quickly though. Is that helpful? We're gonna take three quick questions, okay? We're gonna go to Gooley. Uh, we're going to go to Charlie, we're going to go to Sion, and uh, I'm going to get a last question in before we break for the, uh, for the party tonight. Guli, go ahead. Uh, we have done future schools in the past 10 years, uh, work with schools globally, uh, China, uh, US, Israel, Finland, Canada, and uh, we have a solution for schools, for future schools. My question for you is, uh, would you still like to work with K-12 students? Yes. And how? Well, I, I want to know what your system is. I'm, I love the idea that many of you supported here, which is reversing it, that I know the Khan Institute's done, which is where basically when they're in school, they're getting help and they're being worked on, but they go home and they take in yes. the class. I also love that because quite frankly, you can hire the best teachers in the world because they can watch it. They don't have to be in class. You don't have to have all, not all teachers are equal. Uh, I'm not a big believer, by the way, in equity, just personally. I think equity sounds good, but the way we're executing equity is making everybody equal. Not everybody has equal skill or equal drive or equal caring or equal hard work. And I don't think that's what, what the goal should be. I think equal opportunity is there. And so for, yeah, I'd want to know what the system is, right, okay. that makes that happen. I want to know what, what the system is, and if it's something usable, then I'd look and say, where can I help you scale that, and then how can I play any role that would be supportive? Wonderful. Thank you. We will talk more. I'd love to hear more. Thank you. Thank Fantastic. you very much. Thank you. Charlie. Thank you. Um, before Joe's question, I was going to ask if you could add a pre presidential moon shot to the list, but I'm not <laughs> going to ask that now. Uh, I was going to ask, unless you want to answer it, of course. No. Um, but I was going to ask, we've been learning a lot about longevity and clearly mindset is a massive thing in helping people, not the people in this room necessarily, but the people outside this room have a longevity mindset. Can you give us any advice as to how we can help people help themselves to have a more, uh, have a better longevity mindset set and take their health more seriously? I think, I'm sorry to be so simplistic, but I think it has to start with your example. No one's going to listen to you talk about something you don't live it. So, you know, one of the reasons I think I was able to influence a lot of people in this area is because the level of demand that make my body and the level I'm able to deliver energetically is more than most people would expect. So it's like, what is he doing? So they're willing to listen. And they also see, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I'm always looking for more answers and better answers. So I think your own model is the most important thing. Uh, if you're talking about it and you're not living it, your influence is gonna be limited. I think the second thing then is, um, is to make sure you find things that are cutting edge that can help people because when you find something like, you know, uh, one of the gifts of my life used to have all these huge long mission statements. Now it's really simple, how can I help? Every day of my life I get a phone call and at this stage of my life, I get somebody every week or two that's got cancer or somebody who's got, had a stroke or a heart attack or Alzheimer's. And fortunately, I can steer them in the right directions because I've done my homework. And, you know, um, please pick up Life Force if you haven't done it because it's the best out of the 150 of the best doctors out there. We're not taking any money from it. We donated all the money from it. But I think you'll all find tools in there that a lot of people don't even know exist that can solve problems. And if you don't know it, ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is pain. Ignorance is poverty. Ignorance is death. death. You know, so we really want to make that happen. But I'd say arm yourself, live by example, arm yourself. And then I think it's like point out the people that people are inspired by. Like, you know, LeBron spends a million dollars a year on his body. You know, not everyone's going to do that. But you start seeing his disciplines that allow him at this level to still perform at this stage of life. It's pretty impressive. Right. Tom Brady, you know, same thing. And all of these people, you know, Jack Nicholas, when we were together in uh, three or four years ago at the Vatican, 
he was there and I got a chance to visit with him and he did endorsement over a book and so forth because like he was not able to walk or play tennis or golf and they were gonna fuse his back, which by the way, 57% of the time it does absolutely no good and then you become immobilized, that's the stats. But people get their, their they freeze, it's insane. But anyway, he did stem cells and now he plays tennis and golf again and he's 80, what, 82, 83 years old and so forth. So showing role models is the other way I try to do it. Be a role model, show role models, and be incredibly informed so when people need it, you can help them. Then they'll tell other people, oh my God, you know, I went in there and, you know, I thought it was going to die and here I am. I'm healthy and I made it through the situation. I think those might be three things to consider. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tian, thank you for your question. Oh, thank Tian, you. what do you got for us? Uh, first of all, Peter, I got to give a shout out to those shoes because they're thank awesome. Thank you. Thank you. These are um, Mike Koenig's uh, <laughs> uh, special uh, shoes. Thank, thank you for everything that you're doing, especially with food insecurity. Now, when you were thinking about tackling food insecurity, you got to also think about how do you tackle food waste? Yes. And so I was wondering if you've considered um, using space technology, which is freeze drying food. And the reason why I say that is because when you freeze dried food, you take the waste out and you, sh I mean, you take the water out and you ship the nutrients, yes. which reduces the cost of everything. And then Sian it was on be the SpaceX first private mission to orbit. Wow. Yeah, I actually, uh, yeah, two years ago, I became the first black female to pilot wow, a spacecraft. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> Congratulations. I, I also lived in a moon, a Mars simulation for four months for NASA to investigate wow. food strategies for long duration space flight. And that's when I got introduced to freeze dried technology where you can have freeze dried fruits, meats, vegetables. You take the water and out. And ice cream. And, and ice cream. <laughs> although the ice cream's not as good. <laughs> uh, but what it does is, it, you know, freeze dried, um, food becomes shelf stable for up to a decade and then yes. it's there for when you need it. So I was yes. just wondering if you addressing in your food insecurity, the food waste issue and how we can maybe in, introduce space technology to help that. I love that idea. Um, Feeding America, there's a, a, a group of young people that have created a computerized program that can track food better than anybody's done before. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're believing they can save about a billion meals just by that process alone. So I'm working with them. But I think mm -hmm. the freeze dried is brilliant. I, I don't have any reference for it. I'd love to have, share with you and, and talk to some of the people we know about in that area. I would love to talk to you I, further I think, on this because I, I think, think that, it's a game changer. Okay, I'd love that. That'd be okay, wonderful. Thanks. Thank you so much. I will say one other thing though, too. Can please give her a hand. <laughs> The, in doing our uh, research about you know creating clean cell technology or stem cell or, cl or mm -hmm. clean food as they're to describe it, you know most of you know it's built in a bioreactor. I was just with Sheikh Tanu. I didn't have a chance to tell you this um, last week, and there was a gentleman there. They have a firm that's doing that type of work with foods, but they're also doing a similar thing. They're making fertilizer that supposedly has no release of gases, but also they can send the bacteria to grow it. So we don't have all the shipping problems that we're having right now in costs yep. to a place where the bioreactors local and then they make the fertilizer there and not have the greenhouse gases. So I'm looking at every option I could. So I'd love to get your card. Yeah, because it. also freeze dried technology is really cheap and can be put everywhere. That's great. I'm happy Thank to make you for the that. connection. Yep. Great feedback. Give her a hand. Yep. So Tony, um, tomorrow is our commitment day, our member moonshot day. Uh, we have Ray in the morning. We're going to do some Q&A with him talk about uh, his views, right? He's still holding to 2029 as, yep. as human level AI and 2033 for high bandwidth BCI. Yep. Um, and then members are getting on stage here to share their, their moonshots. Uh, part of my goal of having you here now was to inspire everybody here uh, to what can be done. Uh, at the end of the day, going, stretching yourself, uh, beyond what feels comfortable in your moonshot. You want to give some advice on, on how or where they should push? I think it's different for all of you, right? We're all individuals. I can't give you something universal, just principles. And I think I try to do that in the beginning here for you. I think the most important thing is if it doesn't stretch you, it's not going to excite you. If it's not going to excite you, you're not going to stay with it. And it, it needs to be something that's like, feels like legacy for you. Like any one of the moonshots I've had, I've like, you know, I've had the privilege of working with hundreds of millions of people over the years and helping people improve their lives. Uh, that to me would be enough of a legacy. Then like, okay, if I could feed a billion people, that's a pretty good legacy. Well, okay, a hundred billion meals, that's an even better legacy. And it's just like, 
if it's something that if you did nothing else in your life, that's the only thing you did, you hang your hat on and say, that was a life well lived outside, obviously your family and your children. To me, that's the type of moonshot you'd want because that's what's gonna keep you up, get you up early, keep you up late. That's gonna give you the drive to attract the kind of people to do it, because you're not gonna do it by yourself. Anybody does that's nuts, you know? It's like you, you have to attract the right people. No matter how smart you are, we're all better together. But so it's gotta be a vision that's just not just good for you, it's gotta be a vision large enough that others grab a hold of it and run. And I think that's been the same. Yeah, and to the when express. you're on stage tomorrow, it's what do you need? Who wants to partner with you, right? The, 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 the value and the energy of partnership and community here is one of the benefits you're gonna get. Everybody here is, here to make a difference in the world, to uplift humanity, to make a dent in the universe. So I'm hoping that you'll have either found each other already or tomorrow will facilitate that. That's awesome. Yeah. Maya, I can't let you not ask your question, but we do need to go, so make it short, please. Okay. Uh, oh, darn. Uh, mic two, please. Yeah. Okay, hi. Hi. Um, it's, I'll try to make it as, as, as short as I can. Um, it's a two-part question. The, the first... <laughs> It's fast, it's fast, it's fast, I promise. <laughs> so the first part of my question is, so I run a VC in Nigeria, we invest across Africa. We also have a nonprofit that trains about 100,000 a year in technical skills. So um, I'm, I'm we, and we are not new to the concepts of poverty, slavery, these sorts of things, but my focus is on democratizing access to technical skills, which lead to entrepreneurship, which lead to equity and ownership, and wealth creation. And so if we can make it easier for people to be entrepreneurs and get in the technical space, then they can transform generations. So have you thought about transforming disenfranchised community through equity and ownership? And my second question is, so one of my limited partners says this thing, it's awful but kind of true, um, is he says he hasn't met a successful founder who was loved by both their parents. And what, <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by that is we have all gone through uh, or I, there seems to be what I've noticed, and it sounded like you said forefathers, like how you grew up. There's this, and and I, you know, everything I've built has been from the ground up. I came from you know modest modest beginnings. Um, there's there's this in this arc of a, of an entrepreneur's development. I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> it starts with running away from the thing that caused you harm in your childhood or upbringing, et cetera, et cetera. And then it being a fear-based motivation and that transition to love and abundance. And I'd love to hear about your journey from your running to that pursuing love and abundance. Well, let me see if I can tighten that way the hell down. <laughs> um, the answer to the second part first. Uh, uh, my mother was the most influential person in my life. She was a beautiful human being. I never even said anything about what she did until after she passed away, and I didn't even do it then. But one day I was with this group of kids from New York. They were all from uh, African-American and Hispanic families where there was only a mother and no father. And they were feeling like they couldn't handle anything. So I was trying to tell them that your, you know, basically your biography is not your destiny. Your past does not equal your future unless you live there. But I realized I'm a tall white guy who's doing well, so they're not going to listen. So I told them the whole story, what I really went through, and left all the details. And they were all crying their eyes out at the end. And I said, look where I am now. And I said, I want to tell you something. I have no anger towards my mother, because when you mix drugs and alcohol, people aren't themselves. And I said, so if my mom had been the mother I'd hoped she'd be, I would not be the man I'm proud to be because I became a practical psychologist to, to protect my younger brother and younger sister. I learned to predict human behavior, how to change and alter states. So much of what I have today that's maybe more sophisticated, I learned at that stage. So I don't know that every great founder has had no love in his life from one of his parents. I don't want to make that generalization, but I would say it requires hunger to achieve. And it's the thing we're missing in our culture. Not everybody, but people that are hungry. But I mean, not hunger for food. I'm talking about hunger to be more, to do more, to give more, to share more, to create more. If, if you're just hungry for a little goal, you're going to get the goal. It's easy to satisfy yourself. But if you're hungry to serve something much greater than yourself, whether it be your child or your family or community or humanity, I don't mean virtual signaling bullshit. I mean what you really do within yourself that no one else knows. When that's happening, you feel fully alive. And so, yes, mine did start with anger, I'll show her, and then it moved to love and joy and service. And I, I think that's a common pattern. Some people get stuck, so that's your first one. Your, your, your previous question, what was it again? Your, 
leveraging equity and ownership to yes, the equity and ownership. The so, so yes, you know, I believe, you know, uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with organizations that loan money locally and the money stays with the community and so forth. So I've certainly made those. Um, but my biggest thing is teaching innovation. So I'm, I'm good at creating a transformation because I do things in a, uh, in a, um, how should I say, in total, a total immersion. If you, if any of you went, how many went to college and learned a foreign language and raise your hand. If you learned foreign language, college, high school, drop your hand if you no longer speak it with a squat. <laughs> okay. Most of you have dropped your hands. Some of you live in cultures where you still use it, but most people don't because you learn a little bit at a time. But if I dropped you in Italy and said, you know what, I'll pick you up in 90 days without a teacher, I guarantee you 90 days later, I'll come back to you speaking because you're in the immersion, breathing it, seeing it, feeling it, experiencing it. It's how we learn best. So I believe that's the best way to teach. And so I like to do that with entrepreneurship. And I just saw Shiv's face somewhere out here, but Shiv from the Sun Foundation is a dear friend. There's Shiv right there. He is an organization that last year, was it 600,000 people last year that competed? Yeah, around the world, 600,000 young people competing, uh, bringing forth their kind of like Shark Tank description of their businesses. They gave them each about $1,000, everyone. They gave them SaaS software, they helped them. And then the winners get additional funding and so forth. So this year we're targeting a million people together and I wanna train those million people because now I can scale things like I never could before. So we can do that with your community as well. As long as you've got access to the internet, we can make it happen. So see us or see Shiv up there, he can tell you more about it as well. We can make it happen. Give her hand. Thank you so much. Harsha, I'm going to give you the last question. You've been standing up and waiting a long time. Let's keep it brief. Very short. Okay. So, in fact, I don't even have a question. I have a challenge for you, Tony, because you changed my life in 2007, where I got your book, Awaken the Giant Within. And my challenge was I wanted to be an inventor. And within a year, I had a target of one patent, I got seven patents issued. Now I'm trying to ha give it back by skilling a billion people because that is what we need. It is in every skill store which we are building. And to skill those people, I need them motivated. And for that, I'm throwing you this challenge where I want you to compete not against a Stanford professor, but against a holographic AI avatar of yourself and have that avatar teach the control population and you teach the population and we'll keep running it and it will beat you sometime, you will beat it sometime, but till the end of your life, we need to keep running this so that even after you, that can keep continuing it. So, Does anybody understand what the yes, hell he just said? So. <laughs> uh, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. <laughs> I, what I will say to you is that's exactly the kind of thing we're doing. But because of COVID, I found a way to scale. So I can train, like I did, a million and a half people for six days. So if you want to you know, find ways that we can help with certain skill sets or spreading that, I'd be more than open to that. Again, you can see me or you can see some of my friends here. I will see. Thank see? you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Let's give it up for Tony Robbins. Yeah.